inside the sea. None would come close, you wouldn't let go. What worked back then will work again. I know the blood is still.
the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Church Online. It's great to be with you this morning on Easter Sunday, uh, a time of celebration for us who have a, a faith in Jesus. Uh, with me this morning are Peter Hiya. Hiya. and Katie. Hello. And we're going to uh, lead the service this morning. The early church used to greet each other with the expression, Christ is risen. So I'm going to say that to Katie. Katie, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that was the response of the early church. I think it was a lot of things. It was a greeting. I think it was a bit of a secret code that if you gave the right reply, it meant that you knew the person was a, was a Christian. And uh, it's also a declaration of faith. It's a declaration of truth. It's a great way to start our service this morning. Peter, Christ is risen. Hey! <laughs> That's a nice uh, response as well. Do you want to explain that response? I mean, Christ is risen at Easter is just that moment of excitement for me. It's, it's victory, it's hope, it's freedom, it's release. It's that, that moment in the film when there's the darkest moment and then it turns out the hero's there. It, it's the victory over everything. And yet for Easter, it's victory for me personally. It's not something I'm watching. It's a personal victory for me that Christ has won for us. And it's just so exciting. Excellent, Peter. Thank you for that. Katie, could you explain to me for just one minute, what does Easter mean in one minute? Okay. So the thing I would want people to understand and about what Easter means is that if you're not sure who God is, if you're not sure if there is a God, if you think you might have certain ideas about God, look at the Easter story and see the reality of who God is. Because we see God as the Father who sent his only Son in our place. But we're on Easter Sunday, not Good Friday. And so when we read the whole of the Easter story, I don't only see the nature of God and his willingness to send his Son. I see as well the hope for me in resurrection, in that I am free, forgiven, and eternity is secure for me in heaven with him because God sent his son. That's what I would love people to understand. If you want to know who God is, who Jesus is, look at the Easter story and understand it through that lens. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. It's like the most important point in human history, isn't it? Yeah. It's where, where humanity regains hope. Um, hope that was lost is now found because God became one of us. Uh, it's an incredible. We, we celebrate Christmas where we celebrate Jesus being born, but we should celebrate even more Easter when we realize that Jesus' death and then being raised to life is, is the, the whole future, the whole hope for us. Mm -hmm. It's just a great time. And let us have a sense of joy this morning as we, as we sing, as we celebrate, as we hear um, a talk later on. Let us have that sense of joy that uh, there is a hope and a future in Jesus. We're going to listen to some worship uh, shortly, but before that, 
Peter, would you uh, pray with us? Hmm. Yes, Lord. Lord, on Easter Sunday, we see you for who, we, who you are. We see that your name is victory. Lord, we know that you are victory and we know that you are love and we know that you are living hope. So we pray um, praise to you for that. We pray praise to you for the victory as you rose to life again um, and the surety that we have of our own hope in that. And we pray that you will reinforce that surety in us. If there are people who have not known that surety um, of of being made whole, of being healed by your victory, we pray that they will feel that today. Um, and we will pray that for those of us who felt it already, that you will give us a deeper and a deeper and a deeper sense of it today. Amen. Good morning, One Church. Happy Easter. Um, we're just going to spend a few moments in worship this morning and we might not be together in the building worshiping, but um, I just pray that you'll feel the spirit in your homes this morning just as we come together and celebrate Jesus being alive. Um, just encourage you just to take a few moments and just begin to thank him. And if you can't think of anything, just thank him for the cross. We're just going to sing about this hope being alive in us this morning. So yeah, just join with us in worship.
I hope you really enjoyed that worship this morning. When I was listening to it this morning, it really stirred something in me and the celebration and the joy uh, of Jesus' resurrection. Next, we're going to listen to our talk this morning, and it's from Neil Harvey. Uh, Neil is a, a friend of mine. He's part of the Equippers Church Movement in Surrey, and uh, he is someone who has a great story, a great story of what his life was heading towards and how Jesus transformed his life, literally transformed his life from being a drug addict, being in a prison cell, to coming to faith and, and coming to ministry. Uh, it's a really great story. So I want to, want to encourage you to just really listen in this morning. And uh, I'm sure you're going to be blessed and challenged when you hear Neil's story. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, happy Easter to you all. Uh, it's great that we got this opportunity to, um, to do this recording. And uh, I guess it's the next best thing to actually meet him in person. Uh, there's uh, a lot of us are recording stuff these days, and that's how we have to do it for the moment, I suppose. Uh, but it is great to be able to be with you this morning and just share some thoughts uh, around um, my testimony. That's what I wanted to do this morning, just share some things about my, my testimony. And uh, I'm really looking forward to getting out of lockdown, probably like you as well. Uh, I've said a few times now to different people that Boris Johnson uh, has grounded me more times than my mother ever did. <laughs> the, the funny thing about that actually is that's partly a joke because uh, my mother actually grounded me quite a lot when, when I was younger and, um, and I got into a fair amount of trouble when I was, when I was young. And, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about my life and, and how God changed my life, how God stepped into my life and, and uh, has ba basically radically transformed uh, every part of my life really. Um, 18 years ago, I want to take you back there. I want to take you back to 18 years ago when I was in a prison cell in Cardiff. I'd been a naughty boy for, for a number of years. Uh, I got into the drug scene when, uh, when I was about 14 years old. And one thing led to another, as it often does. And uh, it, different drugs became what we call gateway drugs. So you start on one thing and then that doesn't really do it for you anymore. You meet some new friends and they're doing other things and then you get into other stuff. And uh, one thing led to the next thing. And by the, time I was, uh, by the time I was 18, I was really addicted to drugs. And it became like my life. That was my life for the next 18 years. Uh, sorry, 10 years from the, from the age of 18 to the age of 28. Uh, I was um, really living, living a life that was quite dark, uh, very confusing, couldn't hold anything down really like a job or anything like that, couldn't keep hold of relationships. My life was pretty much a mess. And then um, 18 years ago, like I say, I ended up in, uh, in prison. And there I was in, a car in Cardiff prison in a cell. And that's when everything came to a head for me. I guess you're probably even thinking now, like when somebody's in prison, they've got a lot of time to think. And that is true. And I was on the remand wing, locked up for 23 hours a day. And uh, there's a lot of time to think and a lot of time to process. And that's exactly what started to happen. I found myself in this cell by myself. And, and what started to happen was that I started to have, I guess what you would call a kind of an encounter with, with God. And this is, this is how it went for me, because everybody's got their, uh, their own personal stories, I guess, of how they met Jesus, if you have met Jesus. Uh, but this is my story. This is what happened to me. I was in my cell one day, and uh, all of a sudden, I experienced this incredible frustration. It was like a frustration that is quite difficult to actually even put into words. It was something that like really just rose up inside me and I just felt so, so frustrated with life, with my situation, with myself. I had tried many, many things to try and break free from, from my, my addiction and from the lifestyle that I was living and nothing ever worked. Nothing, nothing ever seemed to work. I could never break free from the pattern that I was stuck in. And, and, that, and one day I just felt this incredible frustration when I was in that prison cell. And, 
and as I felt this frustration, it kind of led into despair, really, because I was trying to figure out a way of how can I get out of this life? And I'd actually tried different things. I mean, I'd even joined the army at one point, and that didn't work out either. Uh, so I had tried many different things to try and break free, uh, but I was now losing hope. I was losing, like, the grip of reality. And I felt like I was plummaging into a sense of despair. And as I was feeling that in this prison cell, just out of the blue, I heard this voice. And this voice asked me a question. I don't know whether it was audible or whether it was just like a silent inner voice inside. You know, it's, I, you know, it, I just know they felt really strong inside me. And I knew that it was like a voice speaking to me. I knew it wasn't just my thoughts, you know, but someone was actually speaking to me. And this voice asked me a question. And the question went like this. Don't you remember who you are? Just like that. Don't you remember who you are? And then all of a sudden, it was like somebody pressed play on a DVD. And, and I saw flashbacks of my life. And I started to see like years ago when, when, you know, when things were happier in my life, when things were better, uh, you know, before I got into the whole drug scene. And I think this question about don't you remember who you are is kind of was really, I think, was linked to two things. Number one, it was linked to the fact like that before I actually got into the whole drug scene, I was actually a decent person. You know, I'd kind of, I'd become something that I didn't want to be. But before all that, I was actually a decent person, you know, when I was younger. But the other thing that, that really, uh, that I think it was linked with was that when I was younger, my mother used to take me to Sunday school when I was a child. And, and all of a sudden, when I heard this voice, don't you remember who you are? Uh, it, was, it, was like, it was like all that stuff from Sunday school and when I was younger, and when I used to go to the Sunday school and to the youth club and church and stuff, it was like all that would just seem very, very fresh again all of a sudden. Like, like all the memories of different people that I knew from Sunday school, um, even, even people that used to teach us in the Sunday school, you know, it was just incredible. Just think now, like after all these years, there I used to go to Sunday school, I used to go to the youth club in church, went away from it all, got into a, a, like a drug, drug life, drug scene, and then all those years later, 28 years old, God had never forgotten about me. And he started to bring it back to my remembrance of that, you know, I used to like have this kind of relationship when I was G with Jesus when I was a kid. And it all just seemed so fresh, like it was yesterday. Like it just all seemed so like, wow, I can remember that, you know? And I'd completely forgotten all about my experience in church and this kind of relationship I had with God when I was a kid. So all of a sudden I'm experiencing this, like this frustration, this despair. And then when I was watching this, like this DVD play and in my mind, like I said, you know, then I started to see the ugly points. I started to see the, the you know, the points um, in my life where I'd kind of hurt people, done things that I shouldn't have done, um, made stupid decisions. And, and all of a sudden I felt like, I felt like I'd literally trashed my life. And I never, I'd, I'd never felt that before. But all of a sudden I felt like I trashed my life. And that, what, what that brought on me then was like this really sense of like, I don't know, shame, um, just this overwhelming sense of like, oh, wow, I think, what, what have I actually done, you know? I don't know if you've ever had this feeling where, where you've been caught out on something, you realize that you've done wrong, and like your stomach turns over, you know, like you get really like these hot flushes, you know? I don't know if you've ever experienced something like that before. But I was experiencing that in that prison cell. Nobody around telling me, nobody around talking to me, just came under this kind of like what the Bible calls like a conviction. Like I suddenly had an awareness and a realization of what I'd done. So I, there I am in this state, feeling ashamed, feeling guilty, feeling like, wow, what have I done? You've trashed your life, Neil. And then the next thing was that this voice that spoke to me the first time spoke to me the second time. And this voice said to me, Neil, if you want a second chance, 
I can give you another chance. And when I heard that, I thought to myself, wow, this is like, can that be true? You know, it's like, could it be possibly true that I could actually get a second chance of life? I mean, how, how can it be possible? I felt like somebody was trying to tell me that all the stuff of my life beforehand could kind of just be, you know, deleted in a sense, and I could start afresh, I could start again. And I thought, wow, can that actually be true that you can actually start again? Can you get a second chance of life? And of course, I've realized since, you know, of becoming a Christian and making a, making a response to Jesus, that I've realized, you know, the Bible talks about being born again. No, I love that phrase. I don't know about you, but when I think about that phrase, I think, wow, born again. Just like, just think, imagine, it doesn't matter how old you are, you know, you could be 65 years old, and the Bible says you can be born again. Now, this is a mind-blowing thought, actually, and Nicodemus, who was talking to Jesus one day about this, when Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Nicodemus said, well, how can that be possible? You know, how am I supposed to enter into my mother's womb again and be born again? And Jesus said, no, I'm not talking about physical birth. I'm talking about spiritual birth. I'm talking about being born again spiritually. Now, just imagine that for a moment, guys. Let me talk about myself for a, moment, for a moment. I was an absolute mess. I was a ruin. I was addicted to drugs. My life was a trash. And Jesus came to me in that prison cell and said to me, Neil, I can give you another chance. You can actually be born again. Now, I don't know about you, but that blew my mind when I heard that. When I saw something that I'd never seen before, because I'd never seen this before. I'd never seen that that was a possibility. I never thought that I could have a relationship with God. I, 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 didn't even, I wasn't even thinking about God. I wasn't even thinking about Jesus. But yet, I knew I needed a fresh start. I knew I needed something new. And I, I, I reckon anybody will tell you, I believe that everybody loves a new beginning. Everybody loves a new beginning especially when God is in it. <laughs> now, that makes all the difference, especially when God is in it. And for that moment, for me, God was right in it. And he was saying to me, Neil, I can give you a second chance. I can give you another chance. And I started to see that like this hope was filling up inside me. And I'm thinking, wow, I can, can I start again? Can I start again? And I remember having a, almost like a conversation with this person in my mind, whoever it was that was talking to me, and I was saying, is this possible? Can this happen? And I felt like this voice saying to me, yes, it, it can happen. And I've been waiting for this point in your life that you, where you would respond to me. It was like God had me in a corner. He had me in a prison cell. I couldn't run anywhere anymore. I had all the time in the world to think. 23 hour a day, bang up, no TV or anything. Man, I tell you, what, that's the worst grounding you've ever experienced. And, you know, that, that, was, that was hard. That was hard. But God broke in. God broke in. And then, and then the next thing was that I remember turning around and asking this person, because I remember I'm having this kind of conversation in my mind with this person. And, um, and I, I asked the question, who are you? Who's talking to me? And the name that came back, Jesus. It's Jesus. And when I heard that name, man, I tell you, I, it's so difficult to put into words but I felt this incredible sense of love fill me. I felt this incredible sense of hope fill me. Uh, and, and I could see something into the future that I'd never seen before. And I started to respond in my heart. I was starting to like, get excited. I mean, none of the other guys on the landing would have known what was going on in me in that cell on that day. But something powerful was happening in me because of the power of the presence of the Lord. My cell, it was like my cell got filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's like I was getting filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I, I didn't even think myself as a Christian, but as I, was, as I was responding, God was doing something. I was getting so filled with hope. It was simply incredible. I remember one day writing to my grandmother, my granddad, because I had a very good relationship with them and I was living with them actually before I ended up going to prison. And I remember writing to my grandmother one day and, and, and you know, we, all our grandkids, all the grandkids, we used to call her ma'am. And I remember writing to her one day and saying, ma'am, 
because she used to call me Little Boy Lost. That was, her, that was her title for me. Every time I'd walk in the house, she'd say, oh, there's my Little Boy Lost, you know? Because I was lost, you know, I was very lost. And I remember writing to her one day in that prison cell and saying, ma'am, do you remember that Little Boy Lost? Well, he ain't lost anymore. And I knew it. I felt like I was coming home. I felt like I'd discovered something. And it wasn't just about coming home to my family because I felt like my family were getting something back. It wasn't just about that. It wasn't just about me finding myself. It wasn't about that either. It was a feeling, a strong sense of coming back home to God. That strong feeling of coming home to Jesus. And I tell you what, guys, it was the most incredible feeling, the most incredible thing that I've ever, ever experienced. The rest is history, as they say. This was 18 years ago. When I got out of prison, I started going to a church in Wales, in Brackle Tabernacle. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I was there for a little while, and then I went off to Bible college. But when I went to, when I went to Brackle Tabernacle, it was like I was starting to hear stories then of how people had prayed for me when I was a kid. You know, the people from the Sunday school had been praying for me all my life. Um, in fact, one of the pastors in Brackle Tabernacle, uh, Pastor David Dando, David was a chief superintendent of, uh, of, of, of the, of the run the, run the police force uh, back, back in those days. And he told me afterwards, he said, when I walked into the church, my mugshot had gone across his desk uh, just a couple of days before. And when I walked into the church, he looked at me and he thought to himself, oh, wow, what are you doing here? You know, he'd kind of thought that I'd come to check out and check out the church, you know, and come back and later on and rob it or something. And he actually publicly apologized to me in a men's meeting not long after. And he said, man, Neil, I can see that you've changed. Not only that, there were at least two police officers as well as besides David. There were two other police officers in Brackler Tabernacle that, uh, that had arrested me in the past. One of them, actually one case I was still about to do, in, uh, I was about to appear in court for, and, um, and a guy called Phil Senior, uh, he'd arrested me and he was in the church and he was like, he was a police officer that had arrested me. So when I walked into the church and I saw all these police officers, I thought to myself, wow, God, you're setting me up. What's going on here, you know? But what, what was amazing was I, I started to become friends with these people. There's me, the criminal, criminal activity, organized crime, all that kind of stuff. And I started to become friends with these people. Not only did I become friends with these people, but I became one of the pastors in Brackler Tabernacle. And David Dando actually became my colleague. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that is absolutely mind-blowing. The guy who walked into the church that he thought was coming to check the church out to rob it, became one of the pastors in that church. I'm telling you guys, God is a God of miracles. Only God can do that. And I, I could tell you so many stories. I could tell you so many stories of God's faithfulness and what God has done for me. Um, David Dando's father, actually, uh, another pastor called Pastor Owen Dando, he had prayed for me. I found out about this as well. He had prayed for me when I was a baby. My mother took me to the church as a child and asked for Pastor, David, uh, Pastor Owen Dando to pray, pray for me as a baby. We call it being dedicated to the Lord. And, um, and I remember finding out about that and then going up to Owen afterwards saying, hey, I, I heard you prayed for me when I was a baby. And, uh, and he looked at me and I still remember the smirk on his face. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, and didn't I do a good job of it? <laughs> because 28 years later, after a very, very complicated life in many ways, Jesus broke into my life and gave me a new beginning. Guys, it's Easter. It's Easter. I want to tell you this morning that hope is available. Today is the day of salvation. Your story may be different to mine. Mine is quite radical. Although there was a journey going on before it, and there's a journey since, there was an encounter in that moment. You don't have to have such an encounter like that, although you may have. But I'm telling you now what you can do is just like me, like all of us who do this thing, you can make a simple decision to say yes to this new beginning in Jesus Christ. And if you are doing that this morning, I want to say God bless you and may God give you an amazing, amazing personal relationship with him. It'll make all the difference in your life.
you can be another person this morning. You can respond to the call of God and step into a completely new life. Wow, what a gift. And I pray that you will do that today if you haven't already done so. Well, it's been amazing to be with you all this morning in this brief, brief uh, sharing of my testimony over this recording. I do hope to see you again one day and uh, may God bless you all. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, that talk this morning from Neil. I thought it was really great, really challenging. Uh, it stirred something in me. It gave an excitement in me that a story of someone coming to faith. Peter, what were your thoughts uh, regarding that this morning? Was there something that you particularly uh, challenged you or you thought was good? Yeah, I mean, it was such a great talk. And um, I could see I had all these different thoughts as I went through. Um, and I love to hear any any testimony, any story of how how God moved in someone. And I think that's it's really a story. It's not a story of what Neil did. It's a story of what God did to him or did in him. Um, and sometimes when you hear a testimony and a testimony like that, you think of my boring life that I grew up in a village and I never really did anything particularly bad, you know, by society tick boxes. Um, and you think, well, that's such a cooler story than mine. But actually the place you come to, um, the place of healing um, is the same exciting place, you know, however bad it's been. And, and and I'm not silly enough to think that because I didn't, you know, do something particularly illegal, that means I was actually fine. You know, we, we have to learn that. But either way, we still come to that place of healing and joy and excitement. And it's the same place. And seeing it in somebody else, you're reminded of the place of joy and healing in you. And I'm um, the phrase that comes to mind is um, sing a new song. Um, and it's a phrase in the Bible that says sing a new song. And it's easy to think, oh, that means a song, you know, written within the last five years, maybe. No. Um, so sing a new song. It means there was a song in my heart and now there's a new song in my heart. There's a new thing. It's a song of, you know, the Bible says it's a song of justice and mercy, but it's a song of love um, that I have felt this love. Um, and the other thought that really struck me just as I was listening is it's easy to worry that, what we do matters more than it actually does. So we can know that Jesus is risen from the dead. Even death doesn't have a hold on Jesus and therefore doesn't have a hold on us. But what if I make a mistake? Like if I've made a mistake, then surely I'll still suffer the consequences. And what, what Neil's story is reminding us is actually that's just not true. Like if we really believe that Jesus has victory over death um, and that God loves us. All he's asking for us to do is to reach out and take that second chance. Um, and and he's not even limited to second chance. He'll give you a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance. And at whatever point you think you're at, no, this is the time when I've messed it up. It's not true. There's another chance. And all you have to do is say, yes, I'll take that chance. Yeah, I, I like that part of the story that Neil was telling us that, um, the second chance was available, but Jesus asked him, did he actually want it? Yeah. He had to want it. He had yeah. to want to make that decision. He had to want to move from where he was and accept what Jesus had for him. Um, Jesus offers the gift, and we have to receive mm. the gift. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing, uh, following on from what you said, Peter, was I think it is true that we all have a story. Yeah, And all our stories are unique and different, and some of them might not be as dramatic as other people, but we all have a story to share about faith. And our stories are real, our stories are true, the best stories are real and true, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they are powerful things. And I just want to encourage you this morning, you have a story to tell, you have a story mm -hmm. to share, share your story this Easter. Yeah, I, think I, I, I was just listening to my bible in one year in the car just earlier and it, it had where jesus says no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl um yeah you've got that story don't put a bowl on it sure. yeah yeah just one other thing i noticed uh, and that was how important it is to teach our children when they're young about jesus and that neil uh God brought him back to the place where he remembered what had happened at Sunday school. So I just want to encourage you as parents, as uh, people who teach it, maybe in uh, the one kids work, it's such 
vital things that you do and uh, you cannot sort of measure how important it is and i've heard so many people so many testimonies so many stories people have told where they've come back to faith but the foundations were laid when they were a child and that has really helped them come come to faith so i just want to encourage you uh, if you're a, a parent or you're involved in children's work you're doing an amazing thing keep doing it it will produce fruit because god's word doesn't ever come back yeah. to him void so just keep doing it katie yeah so um there were two things i really felt i think from neil's talk the first one was that he had to be in the place and the time where he was ready to hear from god and uh, i think that's encouraging for us in, in a couple of ways firstly that uh, as those may be praying for people maybe there's people we love people that we're our neighbors in our family our friends who we're desperate for them to be in a place where they accept jesus and uh, we wish we could do it for them we wish we could yeah. take them there now and i think what it really struck me was we do need to keep praying we do need to keep trusting but the individual god will bring to a place where they have the choice to say yes i want that second chance you know and we pray they say yes to the second chance or maybe the first chance maybe they've never known jesus or heard about him but i think it's an encouragement to us keep praying and maybe pray specifically when god brings them to that place that they'll hear god's voice and respond and it really really encouraged me for those that i pray for to just have some peace about i am doing what i need to do that's great that's great as you say often we want to like nudge people yeah. along push them along but uh, god's timing is perfect and uh, yeah that it's like the prodigal son isn't it the that story in the uh, in the bible that someone has to come to that place of of it's often it's like they come to the end of themselves and realize mm. they can't do anything mm. they can't solve anything their only hope is god yeah and, and we have to get to that point don't we? Yeah. and he made it really clear that's not an age-related thing i mean he said 65 i'd go the day before we die whether that's 99 or 35 mm. but you know this is an age-related god's yeah. second chance or first chance if you've never heard of god isn't age related it's not you know it's not at a certain point in your life it's available all of the time however old you are whatever you've done as peter would say however bad in the world's eyes it is i thought that was really encouraging too that it's not an age barrier to this it is just you being willing when god calls to hear and to answer Brilliant. so if someone's listening this morning katie and they've heard neil's talk and they felt a challenge in that what should they do now yeah, so I'm part of the prayer team here, as you know, Marcus, and uh, Marcus is, and Peter will uh, also be available. We would love us and others for you to contact us. You know, um, there's nothing, agree with me, guys, there's nothing more exciting than helping someone find Jesus. Yeah, it's just yeah. the best. And for that to happen on Easter Sunday morning, I may well be excited for weeks. So if you want to talk to us, maybe you want to make that step, maybe you just want to understand if what you're thinking, feeling and hearing is Jesus, if it is him through his Holy Spirit, you can contact us. And at the end of the service, both an email address, prayer at onechurchdover.org and a text number will come up. And just to reassure you, they both come to me. So you've at least seen my faith. It will be me responding and I will either contact you myself or put one of these guys or somebody else from the team in contact to talk with you, pray with you if needed, and just introduce you more into this God who sent his son for you. Great, Katie. So I would encourage you to take up that opportunity. It's been so good sharing Easter Sunday morning with you. I pray you sense the presence of God this morning. I pray that you've been encouraged and inspired and that you've got a sense of joy this morning that Jesus is alive and that means everything has changed and there is hope and there is future. If you'd like more information uh, about One Church, then uh, there's going to be a uh, email address that's going to come up on the screen just like that there <laughs> or there or somewhere. And uh, if you use that email address, uh, we'd be happy to give you some more information about One Church and Please join us next Sunday. We'd love you to join us next Sunday. Good, good day and God bless.
Every, if you radical, come up to the front real quick. Come up to the front. 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 Here we go. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. If you know it, sing it loud. I was breathing, but not alive. Hey, all my failures I try to hide. Just lift it up loud. You call my name. What you do? And I break out of that. I don't know the talk. Hey, you call my name. And I break out of that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know the talk. I don't know the talk. It's you.
Can we do it one more time? Yeah. I feel a little old school right now, too. One more time. 